Good morning and welcome to Neighborhood Christian Fellowship. We are so glad that you are joining us here today. We want to invite you out tonight at 7.30 out to our grassy area where we're going to have an outdoor evening service. These have been awesome and you could sign up. The, The link will be in the comments below. Sign up and join us outside. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you invade our lives? Would you invade our living rooms? Would you invade our homes this morning? God, would you change everything about us and touch us and heal us? In the name of Jesus, amen. apart, our mission at NCF has not changed, and that is to reach our community with the love of Jesus. 
and you can continue to help us to do that through tithing. We have three easy options that you can use. The first is that you can mail a check to our physical address, which is 18821 East Arrow Highway, Covina, California, 91722. Or you can also text the word GIVE to 84321, or even go on our website at myncf.org, click GIVE and do it there. Because of your generosity, we are able to continue to reach out to our community and address the needs that they may have. Well, good morning. I wanted to start by giving you a little announcement and a commercial for our next series. Uh, over the next two weeks, I'm going to take just a little break from preaching. Never in my life have I preached so consistently and <laughs> without a break, really, and that's my own fault since the pandemic started. So since March, we've had 25 Sundays, and I have taken one Sunday off from preaching. Now, what I know about myself is that I am best for you when I have more time to myself in the Word. If I don't, then what I end up doing is I end up taking the Bible and doing this. And the most effective thing for me is to do this. I need to get the Word of God deep within me. So I'm excited over the next two weeks for the guest speakers that we have lined up. They're actually members of our staff. Uh, you already know them, and you are going to love them. So also, the announcement, or that was the announcement. Let's talk about the commercial. Now, over the last few months in our society, I have noticed what I think is a marked shift in something. And it's something that I want to spend some time exploring in our next series. In the next series, we're going to be going through the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, here's the reason why. I feel like, and, and I could be wrong on this, but over maybe the last 15, 20 years in church, one of the things that we have done is that we've elevated a theology of freedom above a theology of love. Now, this becomes very, very important in the way that we interact with each other. It's played out in the comments. You know what I'm talking about. The comments online, on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram. Somebody posts something slightly controversial, or maybe not even controversial at all. And what are you reading is, my point matters more than your point. You're an idiot. I'm smart. What I have to say matters more than you. My freedom matters more than your freedom. This is what we begin to see play out in the comments and what we begin to see play out in Christians. We've seen things that are so condescending online, things that are, that are so demeaning. And, and, and you know what should be so foreign to Christian thought? Condescending and demeaning. These things should never even enter our imaginations, but yet... Because I believe we've elevated freedom over love, this whole sense of condescending and demeaning has become part of our daily vocabulary. So let me tell you about the way that this plays out in the book of 1 Corinthians. So, so just a quick commercial. You, you see Paul just absolutely hammering this church, just laying into them. And, and we're going to talk about that because they've just done a slew of things wrong. And it's all about they want to use their freedom to do whatever they want to do, even if it harms somebody else. And Paul hits on all of these points, and then he finally gets to chapter 13 and says, listen, love acts this way. And what Paul does is he seeks to take the theology of freedom that this church has built and absolutely ruined and hurt each other and, and reorient it to a theology of love. And that's what I want to do for us. Now, I don't think that we're anything like the first Corinthian, the, the Corinthian church or anything. I'm not trying to do this as a polemic against us. But what I'm trying to do is, is show how our culture has fallen into this. And so I hope that you'll join me in this series. And I believe we're going to start uh, September the 13th. You will not want to miss this series. But it's also the reason why I chose to leave the parable we're going to be doing today until last. 
because it's a parable about living out God's love. It's a parable that you are probably very familiar with. In fact, I know I've preached on this parable probably a dozen times, and I did even once last year. And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a parable that even non-Christians know this parable. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 this morning. And we're going to dig into this parable on the Good Samaritan. So Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. And so he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves and stripped him naked, beat him up and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was also going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot and saw an injured man and crossed over the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan who was on a journey came to him, came where the man was, but when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him, bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed on the wounded man, the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took full, two full days' worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these was the neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? The legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy towards him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This parable is about love and not putting limits on that love. Just as Peter asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive? This religious expert asked Jesus, well, who is it really that we should love? In other words, let's put some boundaries and parameters on this teaching, Jesus. I I feel like it's too broad. I feel like this applies to too many. I feel like if we really went down that road of loving everybody, we're going to get to some pretty undesirable people, Jesus. So who should we really love? That's what this parable does. It's It's a teaching about not putting limits on loving others. Which, by the way, is something that we want to do all the time. Putting limits on love is just simply how the world acts. It's sort of the default way of living. I love my family. I love these people. I love those people. I don't love them over there. It's just sort of the sinful way that we've developed in humanity. The parable is about love and not putting limits on it. And it asks a question that I think is rhetorical, a question that's dangerous in our society, but a question that I want us to chew on this morning is, is what if the person whom you despise is actually better than you are at loving others? Now, this is not a parable. This is not necessarily saying you've got, if you're a good person, you can go to heaven. I'm not saying that at all. What, but what this is saying is that just as good people don't get into to heaven or the kingdom of God, neither do bad people. Neither do people who completely ignore the mercy that is due to others. Neither do people who do not love. This parable is not just a lesson on morality, but it is a call to put God's love into action in your life. So what this parable was meant to do was to shame these religious people, right? And to saying, those Samaritans whom you hate are actually better people than you are. 
So why don't you go act like them? I mean, it's surprising that Jesus didn't get crucified after this parable because that would have been highly offensive. For Jesus to talk about love breaking down borders and boundaries, it's a love that's always seeking the best for others. For Jesus to talk about this in the midst of his cultural setting, I mean, they would have just hated him for saying this sort of stuff. Jesus' love that he is talking about here would break social norms with urgency and give you this opportunity to love. The parable underscores the compassion and mercy that are so important in Jesus' kingdom. And they're key to our own discipleship. What Jesus is revealing in this parable is that actually the Samaritans live out better. Leviticus 19 34, to love and to welcome foreigners and strangers. This is what Jesus is showing, that that these people whom you hate actually love God, and they do it better than you do. So why don't you go act like them? See, sometimes we build a religion based off of cliche Christian catchphrases. You know what I'm talking about. Like, you could just go look these up online. And, and I wish I had some, but they're, they're so, like, uh, to me, I, I don't like them um, I very much. Uh, I, I think that they're kind of, you know, cute and catchy and all that stuff. But when we build a religion off of cliche catchphrases or, or Christian sayings, then, then you know what we'll do is we'll leave church feeling filled up. We'll leave church feeling good. We will leave church feeling like, man, ah, oh, the pastor really hit it out of the park today. I, I really, got, I'm, I'm filled up today. But you see, that's how the Pharisees were. The Pharisees had all those catchphrases. They had all the cliche sayings. They, they knew what to do they, they had it all up here, but what Jesus is saying is, it's not about building a religion that knows the right things to say. It's about building a following of Jesus that not only knows the right things to say, but that gets their butts out of the building and goes and does it. That's what it's about, building a religion of love, a love that leads to freedom, but building a religion of love that it actually has an impact on the lives of other people. That's what this is about. That's what this parable is about. Later on, Jesus would teach another parable that would simply underscore this point even more. You know, it's a parable about the end of all things, and we didn't go through this parable in our, in our parable series, but we, essentially Jesus is talking about the separating of the sheep and the goats and on those last days, and you want to be in the kingdom and blah, 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 all this stuff. And, and, and in Matthew 25, verse 34 through 36, it says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared from you before the world began. I was hungry and and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. And then you know the rest of the way it goes. Is Jesus says, then you'll ask me, when did we do this? When did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we visit you in prison? And then Jesus responded, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers or, and sisters of mine. You have done it for me. Jesus is absolutely underscoring that his kingdom is not just about the knowledge base of the gospel. It's not just about knowing the Bible backwards and forwards. Although that's important and knowledge does lead to action. It is so key to know this book. It is so key to read this book day on a daily basis. But if it doesn't translate into these, then what good is it doing you? If it doesn't translate into your actions, into what you do, and how you love people that are not a part of the kingdom of God, then what good is it doing you? 
See, what Jesus is trying to say is, church, we need to get out of our chairs and go do acts of love. Go do acts of mercy. Because every time we do that, we show off who our Father truly is. Every time we do that, we reveal and we testify to the fact that we believe that this book's, what this book says. That we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us. That we believe that God loves us. Every time we do these acts of mercies, we testify to that fact. This parable doesn't exactly tell us how to love our neighbors as ourselves, but it creates a reality where passivity is not tolerated. Where just passing by and being silent and turning a blind eye is not tolerated in the kingdom of God. That's what this parable does. It creates this reality. And folks, I believe, just like the parable in Matthew 25 talks about, that we are going to be held accountable by God for the way that we've lived on this earth. I believe that. I believe that God is going to say, listen, you, you, you sat under this, th- this pastor for so long, and, and, and listen, you've had this Bible sitting on your bookshelf for, for years, and listen, you, when you got a smartphone, you had a Bible on you all the time. Listen, you know my word. Why didn't you live it out? It would be such a shame that if on that day, That God looked at you and said, well, you just have cliche catchphrases, but they have action behind them. How are you going to live? I I, want to end this parable with, with one more observation. And that is this. I really can't leave this parable behind without making explicit that this parable confronts the sin of racism. Christians are as guilty as any in allowing illegitimate boundaries to exist among people. We must not be quiet or tolerant of the sin of racism, whether in the United States, whether it's in Western Europe, whether it's between Palestinian and Israel, Israelis, whether it's be, between uh, the Christian, uh, whether it's between Chinese and and the Han Chinese and um, and Japanese or others. We, we must not be quiet about the sin of racism. To be silent is to give permission. To be silent is to walk on the other side of the road and pay no attention to the injustice. On the basis of this parable, we must deal with our own racism. To be silent is to not seek justice. We must offer assistance to those in need, regardless of which group they belong to. In short, our love, the love that we know that is showered down on us, because of this book, we know that Jesus showered his love on us. Because of history, we know that Jesus actually lived and died and rose again for us. We know that we have this love that that God has for us and that he wants this for you. We must show that to others. As a church, as Christians, we can no longer walk on the other side of the road and pretend that injustice is not happening. As Christians, we must lead in love. As Christians, we must offer love in every circumstance. As Christians, we must put on display the love of Christ. As we go today, as we wrap this, this sermon up, I'm going to end the sermon in the exact same way that Jesus ended his sermon. When he had asked the the religious expert of the law which one was the neighbor to the guy who was hurt, he couldn't even muster up the words the Samaritan. He didn't even say that. He said the one who showed mercy. And so what Jesus ends by doing is saying, go and do likewise. Go and and do. Go and do.
church, let's put those words into action this week. Go and do.
Thanks for joining us today at NCF. We're so glad that we could worship together. If you're new with us, or if it's your first time, we'd love to connect with you. Go ahead and drop a smiley face emoji right there in the comments, and we'll make sure to reach out. If you'd like to get to know a bit more about our church, uh, go ahead and text the word hello to 626-587-3357. If you'd like prayer or a personal conversation with one of our pastors, you can text the word prayer to that same number. Again, thank you for joining us and we really look forward to seeing you soon. Why are you still here? Go and do.